So to gain a strong future for society, do we need a strong education system? If you think we do, does the current education system in the United States provide that strength that we will need? Now, I'm, uh, I've taught for, for gee, over 40 years uh, in public ed and higher ed. Uh, now, I uh, teach master's and doctoral students in educational technology. So I have one foot in education, one foot in technology. And my technology foot says, around the world, every institution of business, manufacturing, military, healthcare has fundamentally changed its assumptions of how to be a good institution. But my education foot says that I haven't seen many schools that have done that. And that's my education conundrum. So other institutions have examined their assumptions and found that they needed to change them. I've identified three assumptions of schools, what, how schools think that they, that what makes them a school, uh, that normally are not examined. Uh, and let's look at some of those. The first one is the structure of school. Schools think their mission is to provide a standardized curriculum to all students through the method of having students grouped starting in first grade and then moving at the same pace from grade to grade until they, they finish. Uh, Henry Ford would recognize that as an assembly line, wouldn't he? The classroom structure is characterized, of course, by compulsory attendance. When do you get the best performance from anyone in a compulsory situation? We group by age in schools, as though age is the primary variable in learning. Do, is that the primary way that you think of yourselves? You're an 18-year-old or a 25-year-old. If somebody says, what kind of person are you? You say, I'm 20. Who do you like to date? I want to date somebody who's 19. We don't think that way, but schools do. And one result of that may be the behavior. So in a teenage classroom, behavior problems are expected. That doesn't seem right. So how do institu educational institutions and individual kids measure themselves and how are they measured? They're measured by standardized tests that measure three things, reading, writing, and mathematics. Where did this situation come from? How did this, this structure arrive? Well, it was brought to the US by Horace Mann, who was the uh, Secretary of Education for the state of Massachusetts in the mid-1800s. And the US did not have a model uh, education system, so he toured Europe to find the one that would be the best fit for us. He found it in Prussia, modern-day Germany, which was the most regimented society in Europe. And of course, the school that he found was nicely regimented. Kids came in, they were put into the first grade box, they stayed there for a year, they moved as a group to the second grade box. And Horace Mann thought that was a nice, orderly, efficient way to organize a school. One curriculum for everyone, except for the nobles, of course, who had private tutors and private schools. But for everyone else, that model of education prepared them for two things, the needs of the state to foster respect for the, for the Kaiser, and second, uh, to prepare students for the, the new industrial revolution, where factories needed them to be punctual and reliable and to follow direction without question. In the US, that system replaced the one-room schoolhouse. Whenever one thing replaces another, some things are gained, but some things are lost. So in the one-room schoolhouse, you don't see much conformity. You see a wide disparity, five-year-olds to 16-year-olds or whatever. How would class have worked then? Would it have been one teacher teaching the whole class like we have in schools now? Or would it be the 10-year-olds reading to the five-year-olds and teaching them how to form their letters, and the 13-year-olds teaching the 10-year-olds the next step in math. 
In that system, everyone learns twice. They learn first when the older student teaches them, or the teacher, and second, when they teach a younger student. They don't learn by cramming for a test, they learn by doing something meaningful. And they remembered what they learned, because this system was successful for generations of Americans. As kids grew up through that school, they gained responsibility and leadership skills because they were responsible for younger children. Now, in, in this baseball team of 12-year-olds, of uh, you see tremendous variation right away just from what you can see. You have the, the, the short, chubby ones and the tall, athletic ones. Uh, some are freckled, some have blonde hair or, or brown eyes. Uh, you wouldn't expect the same shoe size to fit them all. The same pants size we see certainly wouldn't work. How about internally? Some are lactose intolerant, some are gluten intolerant, some are allergic to bee strings. Their body chemistries are different. Their immune systems are different. Yet our curriculum assumes that their brain, the most complex part of each of them, is similar enough that one curriculum can be learned by every kid at the same pace. I, I would suggest that the brain being the most complex organ actually has greater difference, greater variability from one person to another than the most extreme physical difference that you ever see. Now, schools uh, implement academic standards, and that's been going on for Oh, I don't know, 18 years, something like that. Uh, early proponents of academic standards saw a danger in standards, as Tucker and Cotting express here, uh, that some people, and I love their words, will use standards to narrow the curriculum into a little cleft in the rock of drill and practice in computation and grammar, mathematics, reading, and writing, as if that's all there is to a good education. And if you go by how schools evaluate themselves and their students, that is, in fact, what has happened. Carolyn Tomlinson, whose career has been spent training teachers how to meet the individual needs of students, says that squeezing kids into a one-size-fits-all curriculum has already left many behind, and it, it continues to do so. Now, asking people inside schools to look critically at their institution is asking a fish to analyze its water. Without an objective place to stand to look outside and look into that situation, you're, you're trapped by your, your, your environment. So one of the things I teach is game design. And I think, OK, let's look at some of the school ideas, but put them in a game context. Imagine you're in a, a game environment you come into a room, you're told where to sit, you're told what game to play, you're going to play it 40 minutes and not talk to another soul, and when the bell rings, you're going to move across the hall to another room, another game, another seat, same rules. Would anybody be a gamer? Would anybody like that? How would kids respond? They'd want the easiest game where they can rack up the highest score with the least effort. And Oh, you get to level up once a year from like first grade to second grade. Maybe you level up on your birthday, not when you're ready. So the, the question to me is, when do standards like academic standards make sense, that kind of conformity, and when don't they? In terms of behavior, people are surprised that kids don't know how to behave. I think that's the wrong question. Because once kids pass puberty, they gain their, their idea of how to behave from their peers, no longer from adults like their parents or teachers, authority figures. So if you put 25, 14-year-olds in a classroom, what you get is a battle for social stratification. That is 100% normal and to be expected, where kids will battle through uh, discrimination, through uh, intimidation, through bullying, through cliques, uh, through exclusion, and yes, through the cyberbullying that we hear about. 
you have powerful systems of perception. You instantly recognize that chair, even though it's a painting of a chair. And if we rotate that chair, or look at it from the back or the bottom, you instantly recognize it as a chair because you have a, a system of perception that recognizes everything except for one category in the world. It recognizes everything no matter what its orientation. And let me show you what the difference is. Let's stylize that chair and rotate it. And if it's a chair, it's still a chair, but if it's a symbol, now we have an H, but you rotate the H, it's no longer an H. You rotate it a little more, maybe it becomes a four. Or for people learning out this language, uh, written language, suddenly the rules that apply to everything else in the world that you have ever seen don't apply to symbol systems. Because your powerful systems of perception before you learned letters would recognize those as the, the exact same object. That is the strength of your brain. You have learned to recognize these as letters by developing a system in your brain to recognize symbols that is strong enough to overcome the power of your natural perception system. And the kids who have trouble doing that, we label as, oh, those are disabled in some way, learning disabled. Maybe they have a condition. Maybe we'll label it as dyslexia. When maybe their natural perception system is so strong that it's difficult to overcome by a new system that is developed. Now, your brain has five systems uh, that compose your language brain. It's all set to learn language. So when you learn to crawl and then walk and then run, you were also learning to understand the sounds and the words of your language and to produce them because you, your language brain was ready to do that. So where's your math brain? Well, you don't have one. So people evolved, language was around long enough that a language brain has evolved in each of us. But math has not been around long enough for a similar math brain to evolve. How did you learn the math that you know? Because that has been created as a, a math brain in a separate part of your brain that probably is, it has a job of doing something else. Now that's a root cause probably of a condition that affects one to 2% of you right now called synesthesia. Some people will look at, let's say the number five and it will be blue and every, every number three is green because their math symbol system grew in the same part of their brain as the color recognition system. So when the neurons fire to recognize a five, those neurons are also saying blue. So shouldn't we expect, not be surprised by, but expect every kid to have trouble with these core symbol systems of reading, writing, and mathematics because there is no structure in our brain to help us learn them. We have to create the structures. There are some models of, of schools and, and school services in the world that we can use maybe to get ideas to remix a school that will prepare us for the future. The first one is the schools of Finland. Finnish schools outperform every other country's schools in academic performance. And you may have heard that, oh, you need standardized testing to do that. They don't give standardized tests to any kid under 14 because they don't believe in it. They barely believe in giving them to kids after 14. And they, give, they expect that 90% of their kids are going to need extra help because they expect their kids are individuals and that they won't all succeed in group uh, uh, instruction. Our system in the, in the United States expects only 15% of the kids to need extra help. In other words, 85% is a group and they're just fine, we don't have to do anything special for them. Except we don't have the same results as Finland. You may have heard of High Tech High. It's a high school in San Diego, California, inner city. Um, but there they learn more by doing than by studying. They learn by doing projects. And they learn the math and the science that, are, that uh, would be involved in those projects. They write them up. They publish them. 
When they're learning English, they actually write books and, and sell them. Quest to Learn is a school in New York City based on game design principles. Know that the kids don't sit around playing computer games all day. What they do is they learn by design, by designing games. So whatever their, their subject is that they're learning, they design games to teach other students, often like board games. And you know you succeed when you level up in the game. That has shown that you've mastered the content. You didn't get a 75 or an 88. You've nailed it. Many of you are familiar with the Khan Academy. It's a free online service that's already delivered over half a billion short video lessons. And those lessons are like 10 minutes long on, a, on one of 5,000 different topics. The, the student chooses the topic, and it's not conveyed as like a static screen of text to read or, or symbols to figure out or as a printed sheet. It's a video with a real human voice behind it. Through technology, that has seemed to be very successful. Is there any higher ed analogy of, uh, analog of these? One of the goals of many higher ed institutions is to prepare you guys to be global citizens. How do you do that if you come here and stay for four years? So Minerva University is accepting applications for their freshman class to start next year. They don't have classrooms, formal classrooms. They're all live online seminars. So the classroom is wherever you are. But the, the classes are, are together. Freshmen spend their freshman year in the, in the high tech entrepreneurial center of San Francisco. Sophomores get to choose their, their location uh, learning in a foreign language environment in Buenos Aires or, or Berlin. Uh, juniors get to pick uh, a, a high tech business center in the east, Mumbai or, or Hong Kong. And then seniors finish up their education in one of the world cultural and financial capitals, either New York City or London. So in order for schools to, to reinvent themselves in the same way that most other institutions have, they may benefit from examining their assumptions. And as you think about your own educational opportunities, you may think about, do you want to be taught as a group or as an individual? Do you want age to be the dominant variable that determines what you learn? And do you want to be, do you want you and your institution to be evaluated primarily on the symbol systems for which your brain has, was never prepared to excel? Thank you. <laughs>